my name is Scott Tulinski. Uh, I'm a developer. I live here in, in Denver. I've been here for about three years from the Detroit area before that. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about learning today. Uh, my, my essentially job is to learn for a living, you could say, because although I'm in code just about every day, I, uh, I teach code just about every day. Because of that, I'm always having to learn things really rapidly to be able to teach whatever is new and coming up. So, uh, as we all know, things change every single second. Uh, there's a new hot framework, there's a new hot library, there's a new whatever that replaces the thing that you just installed. So, uh, this is all going to be about really how to navigate that. And uh, this talk is called Too Fast, Too Furious, but despite the goofy name of this talk, it's going to be a, a very serious talk. There's not going to be any Fast and Furious skips. <laughs> <laughs> there's gonna be there's gonna be gifts, but this is the only Fast and Furious one. So, okay. So who am I? My name is Scott Talinsky. Uh If you've heard me before, it's probably because of one of these two things. Uh, I created Level Up tutorials in 2012, and I have created over 2,000 plus uh, video tutorials on YouTube and everywhere, all sorts of places. And now uh, Level Up tutorials is a premium subscription service with uh, sort of like a magazine where there's like a new 24 video series coming out every single week, or not every week, every <laughs> month. So uh, this most recent one was on uh, basically headless e-commerce with Gatsby and Shopify, Stripe and some other things. And then uh, next month is going to be advanced headless uh, Shopify, essentially. So we're taking a Gatsby front end, a Shopify back end, and we're going to do everything custom. Uh, it's going to be really cool. Uh, I also am the co-host of a podcast called Syntax. Uh, is there any Syntax listeners here? Cool. Yeah, so if you don't know Syntax at Syntax.fm, is a podcast that I co-host with Wes Boss, and we do two episodes a week. We do a little tasty treat, which is like a 20-minute uh, long episode, and then a tasty treat, which is an hour-long episode with really goofy names, uh, and we definitely know that. So... <laughs> So yeah, so check me out at either of those if you have. So uh, the way we're going to do this is I'm going to be sort of running through some of the six steps that I like to use uh, to gain skills in different frameworks, different technologies, different libraries when I'm learning them. And I want to I want to preface this all with everybody learns differently. There's sort of this um, there's sort of this idea that. This is the right way to learn, or this is the right way to learn it. Uh, if you have something that you disagree with here, and you're, you know, you're, you're very into your way of learning, then by all means, don't let me try to convince you otherwise. So, uh, the first step is we're going to explore, and I like this uh, gift here because, like, Homer's tripping, like, just seriously, he like ate a pepper or something. And he's like in another world. So there's this like internal exploration going on, and this external exploration, and that's really what we want to sort of embody with this section. And so uh, the first thing is really your learning style. And this is your uh, main types that people try to learn things is for through docs, through reading your source, through blogs, videos, quizzes, apps, podcasts, all sorts of stuff. And everybody has a different way of learning. For instance, I really like reading docs. I like reading the source. I like watching videos. Uh, and I listen to a lot of podcasts, but pretty much everything else is no go for me. Blogs, I can't. I, I, I tried so long to like shoehorn blogs in me, and now I just started listening to them, and that's like changed the world for me. Uh, and so, part of this is you want to learn your learning style. If blogs aren't working for you, if you're not a good reader, I'm not a good reader, then don't try to just sit through it. Find a way to listen to it. Try to find a way to experience that content in other ways. There is a billion YouTube channels, and there's a billion people saying videos aren't a good way to learn. But I personally love videos to learn. I watch videos, I put them on at like 1.5x, where I skip through the intros uh, and all that sort of stuff. And I, I really, really love learning that. So uh, you really want to pay attention. And this isn't something that uh, anybody else can do for you, unless, of course, you're me. Uh, my wife is a doctor of educational psychology, and because of that, when we were first dating, she gave me every psychological test known to man, <laughs> and uh, she knows my whole like, profile, right? And uh, at one point, I was given an IQ test, and I, I don't have an IQ. 
uh, because my short-term memory is so low, it's in the absolute gutter, that it invalidates the rest of my test. Uh, I have things up here, and then things that are just down here, and the discrepancy is too large, so they're just like, oh, we don't know what to do with this. Um, so because of that, like, reading is bad. I, you know, I mentioned I hate blog posts, and, and that's something I know about myself, but you're going to have to to look inside yourself and really just pay attention to what's sticking, what's not sticking, what kind of resources you really enjoy, and double down on those. Don't don't just say, okay, I, I like videos. Double down on the videos. Don't, don't spend your time trying to read a blog if it's not working for you. Uh, the next is learning resources. So this is the external sort of part of things is find your preferred learning resources. I like articles on scotch.io. I obviously love level of tutorials because it's my own content and uh, all sorts of stuff, right? But there's other resources that just flat out don't work for me. Even if everybody is saying this resource is awesome, it might not be working for me. The teacher doesn't teach the way, maybe it's too technical, maybe it's not holding my attention, maybe it's just not fun enough. So uh, really here, you want to find your preferred learning resources and you want to really uh, embrace those learning resources. Um, let's say uh, my co-host Wes Boss, let's say he's teaching something on JavaScript and you really, really enjoy it, and then he comes out with a course on React. Uh, you're going to know instantly if you need to learn React. Go back to what works. Don't try to don't try to jump into something that you, you're not like uh, acclimated to or comfortable with. The same way that you are with some creators. Okay. So the next step here uh, is to build your foundation, and I'm talking about foundational skills. And the main point of this is to focus on the stuff that you can take with you from project to project to project. So you're not having to learn from scratch every single time. Uh, this is Sweet Gift. This is uh, Mitchell Goosen in the movie Airborne. It's a Disney movie from the 90s that uh, is on my, my top 10. Uh, highly recommend. It has nothing to do with foundation. I just love this gift. Most of them are <laughs> Yeah, I love that guy. Yeah, that guy right there. All right. So we're going to focus on the fundamentals first, right? Your foundational skills. Because regardless if you're working with React, Vue, Svelte, or any of these things, your JavaScript skills, your HTML skills, your CSS skills are going to come in handy. People argue that, they'll say that, okay, CSS and JS developers, they don't understand CSS, and, or CSS in general for the cascade. That's why they just want to scope everything and throw it in JavaScript. That's not really true. Uh, and, and likewise, people who don't, are, aren't into CSS and JS, uh, you know, they, it's not that they don't know JavaScript or don't care about it, it's that they just like the way they're doing things. But the CSS skills that you're going to build from your foundational skills are always going to translate, whether you're writing your CSS in an object or an interpolated string or a uh, stylus or whatever, those same skills are always going to apply. Uh, so HTML, CSS, JavaScript, programming fundamentals, clean code, those kind of things are always good to invest your time in because they make your startup time with anything uh, much faster. Uh, it's, it's funny, I, had a, I talked about this because um, my very first React course, I have a course called React 16 for everybody when React 16 came out. And, uh, and uh, I had a comment on my YouTube channel and was like, I, I like what React's doing, but I don't understand why they are using the word map instead of like loop or beach or whatever. And I'm just like, that's not React, that's a JavaScript thing. And if you don't have those foundational skills, you would learn that as a React thing. You'd come in here and say, oh, dot map, that's a React thing. But you're not learning that it's just outputting a new array, right? And, and so basically you're doing yourself a disservice in two ways. Now you think this one thing is a React thing, but you also have missed the opportunity to learn a little bit about how React works and why uh, you would need like fragments if you have two components. So, uh, again, we want to focus on the fundamentals. Okay, so next up is uh, native libraries. And I don't mean like native, like your phone native, I mean native to the, the platform or native to the language, right? Uh, for instance, uh, I mentioned at the, the start of the section, we want to focus on the stuff that we can like take with us from project to project to project so we don't have to relearn things. Uh, people always reach for the library-specific thing rather than the JavaScript-specific thing or the Ruby-specific thing. It's like, uh, 
think about like a, maybe like a local storage library or something. People who Google uh, React local storage. And then they get a, a component or whatever, they throw it in everything, it works, fine. But then they move on to view or they move on to spell. And they gotta do the spell local storage. But if you would have just done a JavaScript local storage package, uh, or you don't even need a package, you could have just learned the API. If you take any of those things, then you can take it with it from project to project, and you don't have to be sort of stuck in these worlds of frameworks. Because uh, once you learn these things, these native libraries, these native APIs, these browser APIs that you can take with you, again, you can fire up a spell project, you can fire up a view project, and it's only about learning these little syntactical changes between the two or how they work, and it's not gonna be much effort to learn one or the other. All right, the next thing we're going to do is narrow your focus a little bit. Uh, people want to learn too many things uh, at once. They want to learn too many things, too many broadly connected things all at once. And the problem with that is it kind of ruins your context when you're learning something. So uh, I, I think about this like this. People want to throw in, maybe the, they'll do, I want to learn React, okay? It's my first React project. So we might as well throw a Redux on there. Everybody's using that. Throw on a React router. Who knows, just, just throw in a couple more things while we're at it. That's not gonna work, because what you end up doing is sure enough, you can learn that, and you can build something, and that's great, because you're gonna unlock those skills. But what you're actually doing is sort of learning too many things connected. So when you learn like how to structure a component, you're all of a sudden having to worry about connect, you're having to worry about your Redux store, and you're, you're not worrying about is React and React's fundamentals, and what makes a good React component, you're worrying about React and Redux. And that's great if you're only learning React and Redux. So that's not going to be the case. You're going to eventually move on from Redux as people are using context now. In React, I'm using context instead of Redux. And it's great. Uh, but you know, if I would have learned React and Redux at the same time, it wouldn't have been easy to just jump ship off of that because I have those patterns firmly ingrained in my, in my brain. Um, so you know, one of my things is I like to learn things in isolation. I like to really get into it. So React, just React. I'll maybe do you know the first little bit on just React. And then the moment I need a router, not before, the moment I say, okay, now I need another page. Then I'll throw on React Router. I'll, okay, this is how you do it, okay. Uh, and then once I hit these problems, you progressively sort of add skills. And what you're doing is you're creating these little nodes that you can connect in different ways in your brain, rather than just lumping it all together in like one skill. Uh, again, this sort of goes along with the last one. We always want to be focusing on learning things that are, are things that we can take with us uh, so we don't have to relearn. So, uh, terminal time is pretty much just an extension of this same thing. Um, it basically, when you have these you know, clumped up groups and you have to go learn another clumped up group, that time to learn that next clumped up group is going to be much, much slower than it would be if you had these little islands of understanding. Okay, uh, the next step is to promote excitement. I want to watch this whole thing because I like this guy a lot. Uh, he's a this Korean b-boy named Pocket. This guy in the background with the hat named Gravity, he gets really excited. Uh, there he goes. <laughs> um, yeah, these are amazing human beings. So, there we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we want to promote excitement, and this seems kind of weird, but when you're excited about something, you learn it better. You learn it faster, and it sticks better. Uh, one of the things I like to think about a lot when I'm learning something new is just in general how I felt when I first started developing. Like, when I was in high school, I was, you know, building a Flash website for my band, and it was like, we want... We want, you know, the matrix code to come down when you click the left corner. We want this to fly in. We want all of the letters to fly in from different directions for some reason. I just remember, it was so dumb, but I remember being so excited, like, oh, this is so cool. And, like, those feelings are really push you to learn something. They don't just push you to learn something. They push you to keep going and going and going and persist through errors and all the smashing your head against the wall and all that stuff. Because how many times, uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but, like, there's been so many times when it's been like late at night and I've just got to solve this problem, but it's not even like an anger thing. I'm angry at this, this code for not working. I'm like, 
oh, this is so cool, Eric. Oh, this is so cool, uh, Eric. Oh, man, I'm going to get this work eventually. Uh, yeah, and then it works. You're like, okay, great. And then you're too jazzed up to go to sleep. But uh, I like to really harness that initial energy of when you're first learning, that first excitement. Like Everything, when you're learning it, should be an exploration. It should be like a journey into this new thing, right? And when you get really excited about something, you end up being in this flow state. Uh, you, you see through the lines in the matrix, and you're typing really quickly, and like, you know, you, you could not care less about, or whatever the second, you, you know, you don't care about anything that's going on outside whatsoever. Because uh, when you get excited, you get into flow mode. And flow mode not only promotes, you know, good work patterns and like really focused work, which you will do, but it also really, really, uh, really promotes strong learning skills and really uh, makes those connections much tighter. If you're sort of like watching TV and you're doing this and whatever, you're not going to end up hitting that. You're not going to learn the stuff that you set out to learn. You, you might get your code and your code might work, but you're not going to really understand. Another thing I like to talk about is uh, picking your projects in a way that make it so you care about whatever it is. If somebody's like paying you, uh, to do a job, you're almost inherently not going to be that motivated. It sounds counterintuitive, but psychologically, you're not going to be as motivated. You're going to kind of put it off or whatever. You're going to do it, and it's going to be fine. And I don't like to learn a ton on client projects specifically because there's a little bit of pressure behind it. And maybe sometimes <laughs> that pressure is good, but I like to use my hobbies for projects. I like to pick things that I care about when I'm getting into something brand new. Like when I first started learning Rails, I, I uh, you saw the, the breakdancer gift. I'm a b boy. I've been breaking for 15 years, and uh, my short-term memory, as I mentioned, is terrible. So I would get up in a competition, and I'd get up ready to go. And if if you do the same move two rounds in a row in a competition, the judges see that and they mark you down for it. So I built a little app for myself in Rails that when I use a move, I can check it off, and then it shows me what's left. I give the give them point value so I could sort by like which moves were the best if I needed a, a strong round or something. And uh, like other guys are pulling out their notebooks and whatever, and I just, like, oh, okay, chip, chip. you know, and I made this for myself. And then because of that, I learned trails much better, much faster, and, and just like way more accurately than I would have if it was like, oh, let's do a to-do list. Because sure enough, like checking off a move after I've used it is a to-do list, but it's not really a to-do list if you think about it. So I like to pick my projects. One of my uh, coworkers, uh, he wanted to learn more about uh, doing stuff with a Raspberry Pi. He brews beer. He's like, all right, I'm going to build this whole uh, analytic suite of what's going on in my beer brewing setup based on all these sensors. And that, that's how we learned it. And it worked really well. Uh, I take this all the time, whether it's snowboarding or breaking or anything that I do, I like to take my hobbies and turn them into projects. Because uh, again, you learn stuff really well. All right, next step is Brian Time. Uh, this guy's great. He's got a whole video of this. Like every single thing uh, he does is just like this. It's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> no, <it didn't. laughs> yeah, I love this one, right? Um, this is one of my favorite sections. Yeah, they're all my favorite sections. But like, I can do this. I can do this, man. I, I just, I can zone in on stuff and just code all day if I can, uh, if I have the uh, time and availability. And this is what you do in Brian Time. Uh, one of the things in grind time is that you got to consume a lot of learning resources, and you got to sort of like check your ego at the door, which is hard to do sometimes. Uh, and other times, I mean, you know, there's the whole I'm terrible at coding, switch to oh, I'm, a, I'm a hacker man, I'm going nuts. Uh, <laughs> but there, there's this like a uh, switch that happens. But sometimes you get a little wrapped up in what you think you know. Um, I tell a story about like. Uh, this article that I saw in Render Props when they were first starting to come out. Like, Render Props were first starting to be a pattern. I'd already taught Render Props. I had them in my video course. I had them in my website code. I'm like, I'm a Render Prop man. I know about it. And then uh, I saw a blog post that a bunch of people, like uh, Ibramov and, and, and all these you know, React people, were sharing around this blog post about like five Render Prop things you probably didn't know. And I wrote them. <laughs> I know everything about Render Props. I don't know. I know. <laughs> and it just like breezed by it. And then like three or four days later, you know, more people are sharing it, more people are talking about it. I'm like, huh. Maybe I'll click on it. And I clicked on it. I learned like three or four things. I was like really embarrassed with myself. I was like, man, I, I, I don't really think that highly of my programming skills. 
But like little things like that can really trip you up where you just assume that you know something. But maybe diving in and reading a little bit more, listening a little bit more, taking that extra step and really affirming that knowledge of, I'm a student, I'm ready to learn. I'm always going to keep my mind open to any sort of learning opportunities that come about because there could be anything that pops in here at any given point that's going to unlock some bug down the line or unlock something that I didn't know. So again, to check your ego, uh, you, you know, you will always uh, be a better learner if you're open to being a student 24 seven. Uh, next one is uh, IDD, Iteration Driven Development, uh, where you just care less about the stuff and you just write a lot of code, uh, get fewer ships and make more things. I uh, code into the ground sometimes where instead of reading the docs or reading the tutorial, I'll just like, oh, okay, it says here to fire up this command. Okay, fire up the command. Let me just start typing and see what happens. It breaks. Okay, why does this break? Look it up. Okay, why does this break? And sometimes that's needed. Like maybe do the 101 tutorial, maybe do the 101, whatever you're doing. But then from that step, get your hands dirty. Everybody's too worried about writing bad code or breaking their code or writing non performant code. Like it's someone's day one on React and they're, what's the most performant way to do it? No, don't worry about it. Just do whatever. Just start writing your code because it's not the best practices that are, you're going to learn in the first five minutes of the first day. You're gonna get your hands dirty. You're gonna understand how concepts and systems work. So I like to iterate upon things. I like to uh, refine them, refactor them all the time. And so you write it once, it's always gonna be crap. Even if you know what you're doing most of the time, it's most likely not going to be the single best implementation of whatever you're doing. So worry less about that first implementation. Worry less about that first step of learning something. Um, every single time uh, you iterate, it will become further refined. Uh, I like to use people that are a lot smarter than me. I was a music major. Uh, I am not a computer science major, and some of these programming concepts are entirely foreign to me, right? Like, I, I grew up building websites, but you know, I, I'm, at the end of the day, I'm self-taught. So what I would really like to do is rely on people that are smarter than me. Uh, there's lots of people that are smarter than me, and they do a really good job of putting stuff out there. Uh, when we first uh, were working in Angular, I was working at Ford, and we were building an experimental interface for Ford. And uh, it was like right around the time that Angular was just starting to, to, to make some noise. And we were like, well, let's do this in Angular, right? Let's screw jQuery, we're going to do it in Angular. Um, and me and the other dev on the project had never used Angular, as most people had it at that point. And we started getting into it, and everything worked, but I'm dead sure our code was awful. I'm, we didn't know we should throw everything on scope, whatever. It's just like, go for it. And then we found the John Papa Style Guide, which came out soon after. And that John Papa Style Guide, it, it wasn't just like, here's some best practices, but it was like, here's a roadmap. And you can look at your code. And before I, I read the Style Guide, I didn't know my code was shit. And then after I read the style guide, I was like, oh yeah, we're doing like just about everything wrong according to this style guide. Uh, and here's how we can fix it. It's like, here's a, here's a whole plan for you. So I really love style guides uh, and guides like that. There's a really good repo. I'll try to find it and uh, tweet it out or link it up here uh, about clean code for JavaScript. And it just like, here's, here's what you need to write clean code. And just all, just read it one day and the next day you're going to be a better developer. But I do the same thing for anything. I always look for style guides from knowledgeable people, uh, maybe library authors or people who really know what they're uh, getting into. Um, I also use a lot of snippets. People worry about snippet libraries maybe getting in the way of their, their learning, right? Because, oh, you click a couple buttons and the code generates for you. But no, uh, if you use the snippet libraries, specifically ones that are sponsored by libraries or ones that are like best practice ones or highly recommended for people or highly used ones, what you end up doing is getting a lot of good exposure to code that's correct, best practices, well written code, and uh, sure, you could write all that out yourself, but just simply by experiencing and knowing what this code block is doing that you snippeted, snippeted did, or you know, you just threw it there, whatever, and uh, by, by utilizing that, you're going to become just sort of like, I don't know, more attuned to looking at nice code. It's sort of like art or something, right? You look at art, you don't know anything about art, it just looks like art. But then the more you, you study art history, you know about the, the, the 
patterns and all these things that have come about that led to this piece of art, you're certainly not, not looking at just a painting, you're looking at so much more than a painting, you're looking at the, the true understanding of the painting itself. So again, uh, long-winded way of saying you stand at libraries. Okay, step number six. Uh, this is a great gift too. Uh, Total version. Robocop comes through the TV. He's going to eat one of these tempura things. I don't know what they are because I can't read Korean. Uh, but he, yeah, he, he seems to really like it. There we go. <laughs> she doesn't seem to mind. <laughs> it's very weird. Uh, especially if you've ever seen Robocop. It's a super violent movie. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, this is my, like, they live slide, I guess. Uh, this is consume, uh, and I like to do this one because you can do it with very little effort. You just consume a lot of media, and there are most of which you don't even have to, like, truly focus on. I'll put on a podcast while I'm driving my son to daycare about, you know, a React podcast or a GraphQL podcast or a testing podcast, and just have it on. And, like, I'm driving, I'm not sitting in front of my computer, I'm not taking notes, but just having it on. Uh, I highly recommend syntax.fm if you need a podcast. Um, but I do this all the time with YouTube videos, with blogs, with Slack groups, Denver Dev Slack group, uh, Twitter followers. Twitter is just such a great place to follow. Um, if you get wrapped up in the whole you know, influencer thing, I don't know, but like if you follow people on Twitter that are sharing good tips, good content for whatever it is that you're interested in at any given point, uh, you're going to see that stuff just pop in. Oh, here's a nice little CSS pattern. Uh, I'll store away in my brain for later. Uh, and what happens is, is like through uh, just having yourself experience and being around these things, it just kind of makes its way to your brain somehow. Uh, and if you hear somebody talk about GraphQL enough on a podcast with the correct language, the correct terminology, the whatever, all of a sudden resolvers and mutations and uh, fragments and whatever aren't going to sound like gibberish when you hear them because you've heard them so many times in a context that's related to what you're listening to. So I like to do this stuff. I totally, like, if I'm learning one thing, uh, let's say I'm learning GraphQL, subscribe to a GraphQL podcast, I'll find good GraphQL, GraphQL YouTube channels, I'll find the GraphQL experts on Twitter, I'll find their blogs, I will find where their Slack groups are or their uh, Spectrum, there's Spectrum groups, uh, Apollo, whatever, and I will get into that. Uh, so yeah, just basically by surrounding yourself with a given topic. Okay, so this was pretty fast and furious, uh, and uh, I'd like to finish off with a quote from a very smart individual. Um, yeah, no, this is a bad talk. I had somebody come up to me after this talk and was like, did you really mean that? Because they were like really anxious about it. I was like, no, like, no, it's not about, it's not about that, so to say. It's not about like, uh, you gotta learn the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. It's about when you have to learn the next thing. Um, you you want to know how to do it. You want to know where to go, what to look at. So uh, again, my name is Scott Talinsky. You can find me at S Talinsky on Twitter or at Level Up Cuts. Uh, I'm Level Up Tutorials on YouTube. I'm LevelUpTutorials.com and syntax.fm. Uh, I take questions or anything, I'm happy to do so. So, yeah. So the question was, what resources do I have uh, to keep up with foundational skills? Uh, CSS charts has always been my go-to. When I was first learning like web stuff, way back in the day, CSS charts was there, and it's there today. A list of part, I have the whole a book of part library books. Those are all great. So a list of part, uh, CSS tricks. Um, you know, I would stay away from stuff where you can't like predetermine the quality ahead of time. Obviously, something like CSS tricks has withstood the test of time, but not only that, has such amazing people behind it. Um, so that's really my my favorite uh, resources. The Mozilla docs are really well sometimes, are really good sometimes. Sometimes they're not so good, but a lot of times they're really good. Um, it's actually kind of funny. I end up at, like, you know, W3 schools used to be, like, a huge joke. People used to laugh at it. But they, like, really, uh, they kind of stepped it up a little bit. I don't know when they did so, but I find, I find myself Googling and ending up there a lot more than I used to and not, like, Go on the way from it immediately, like, oh, okay, I'll look at this because they have some interactive examples now, and whatever. So, uh, yeah, those are usually some of my go to. What are you learning now? Right now? Yeah. Um, so, right now, I'm going to be teaching a course 
on Svelte. So I'm spending a lot of time with Svelte 3, um, but that's just for teaching. So I, I code the Level Up Tutorials code base, which is, let's see if I can. But um, the Level Up Tutorials code base is in uh, React, uh, Apollo for the data, and then I use context for my, uh, my state. And then uh, the server is a Meteor-based server, which is basically just a node platform and a build tool, or at least that's all I'm using it for. So I'm learning right now uh, Next.js Next 9, which has the API route. So I'm moving my whole API over to Next.js, and then I'm moving my front end over to Next.js as well. So I'm spending a lot of time there, and it's like just different enough from standard React as you know, stuff. Can you think of a time when you were learning something and struggled learning it, or like found yourself learning too often and Yeah, uh, Redux, man. Uh, Redux killed me. I, I don't know what it was about it. It was the, the, the jargon plus all of the boilerplate code plus like never having that kind of pattern before in, in my experience. When I tried to learn Redux, I think I tried to learn it three or four times. I, I think I came down, I was like, all right, this is the week, I'm gonna learn Redux. And I sat down, I was like, I just don't understand why do I have to call this to call this to call this to do this? Like, why is there this many steps? So I just want to call a function. Um, and it was just it was a it was a struggle. And what it took is it took for me to slow down, right? Like you said, check yourself. And I had to like really slow down. And I had to write a lot of code. And I had to really understand it and say, oh, I get I get why they're doing this, and I get why it's effective. And part of the problem was I wasn't seeing. The, the real benefits to it out of the box, my API wasn't going to go in Redux. It was just toggling a modal, opening up the shopping cart. And at that point, you're like, this is just over it's way too much, right? Uh, which is funny enough, uh, I teach a course on Redux, and many people say, I took five courses on Redux, and this is the only one that opened it up for me. And I think it's specifically because I just flat out didn't get it. So I can call out all the things like, oh, you're not going to get this because this is weird. <laughs> But yeah, that was hard for me. Barring this turning into a discussion about coding 40 hours a week for yeah. work, work versus learning, how do you strike a balance between personal life, learning new stuff, doing the job that you're hired to do? Yeah. Uh, I have uh, two kids, one of which is a, uh, a three-month-old, and so I have no time outside of my 40 hours a week to learn at this point. And like, when I first started Level Up Tutorials, my wife was getting her degree. She couldn't do anything at night, so I was like, oh, I'm just going to program. Like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to code, whatever, because I like to do it. And it was really great. But when I transitioned into this life of not only being a father, but having this like full-time work in front of me, <laughs> it, it got really hard to, to find that new time to learn. So I was so used to just having time at the end of the day. And so I started looking for different ways to use learning inside of my actual day-to-day. -day. Uh, and for instance, um, one time I was working at the University of Michigan, and I, I didn't have any time to learn outside of work, and I kind of got most of my work done, and yeah, I could have gone, gone to my boss and said, hey, can I have some time to learn? But instead, I just took the time, and I just said, I'm gonna build a, a checklist. Uh, I wanted to learn this framework. I'm gonna build a checklist, of, like a pre-launch checklist that all the developers can use. And then instead of my boss being like, well, what are you doing for all this time? I said, oh, look, I just made this thing we can all use. And I, I took that time and it gave me the ability to learn. Now, I understand most like most jobs are, are like, you know, your nine to five is just like crunched. Um, I, I honestly would talk to your, your managers, your bosses, and say like, hey, can I get half an hour a day to learn on something? Just work on a side project. Not even like a, a, a whatever, but if you want to swing it towards your favor, you can always make it so the side project's going to be useful for the team in some sort of way. Um, but I, I would definitely, if you absolutely like any good, like I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, hit on any manager, but a good manager should give you that time. Like if, if somebody, my, one of my, you know, employees came to me and was like, "Hey, I really want to," like, yes, you're going to be a better developer because of it. Take that time, give that knowledge. You know, that that's how it should be. But you know, that I would keep it nine to five. I, I don't, I don't know. At this point in my life, I'm not able to work outside that forty hours a week. Um, before diving into material, how do you determine the quality? Mm -hmm. I uh, I have at this point it's it's been through a sort of experience. I have like YouTube channels I go to, 
Um, so, like, but it, some of it's quality based. I look a lot at production values, which seems like it's you know kind of flimsy. You know, you're you're looking at code, why does production values matter? But chances are, if that person put the effort into the microphone they're using, the, the they know to keep the font big and have the presentation good, or there's a set built. But they have a set built, then you might want to stick around because you know they took the time to build that set. They they probably took the time to learn the material really well. So I look at production values as is a sort of cheat I use to find things. Uh, a blog is usually um, it depends. Like if I'm picking up a learning resource specifically, sometimes there's only one blog post about the thing you're trying to learn. You just got to deal with it. Other times, uh, you have a whole bevy of a uh, cornucopia of all sorts of things. You can just uh, find the ones that look nice. Try them out. Uh, but then, by now, I have like a sort of a go-to for me personally. These are things that I like. These are things that work for me, and again, it's going to be kind of personal. So just keep a catalog of that stuff. One follow-up, you sure. mentioned that you're not, um, reading isn't very productive for you. Yeah. I late. Um, do you use blogs like a text reader? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I, I have a text reader app on my phone, and I just, I share it to the text reader, and it just reads it. I also recently found out that I think Pocket, uh, the app where you can like store blog posts and like them and categorize them, I believe it has a text reader built in, or if it works really well with the text reader that I have. Uh, so that's what I do for like all blog post content. I, I consume it by listening to it because it's just not going to happen either way, or at least quickly. <laughs> so, uh, how do you deal with the disappointment or you know the struggles? Of yeah. Stuff? Like, how, Don't how put too much weight on it. Yeah. Like you're going to learn. I mean, you're going to fail over and over again. Um, I, uh, I've been trying to move my, my code platform off Meteor for a little bit. That's Meteor's bad. I actually really like Meteor, but you know the, the developer community for it gets smaller and smaller, and I'd like to maybe move it to something where there's more uh, contractors available and more people will be able to work on it. And I failed like three or four times trying to move it to different things. I was like, you don't want to write my web pack. Nope. Blows up. Like, well, shit, I guess I'm going to have to uh, uh, rethink this. And it's like a constant, constant, constant failure. But here I am, uh, the next version of it is like working really well. And so it's not about the failure or how many times you fail, it's about understanding why you fail and being able to persevere through those failures. Um, and, and if you really like truly want to learn something, it's totally worth it to, to take that time and, and fail, 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 fail. Uh, don't just fail blindly, fail, and then understand why you failed. Understand why it didn't work. Fail again. Same thing. Yeah. But yeah, I, I read you the bricks 24-7. You know, <laughs> that's how it is. So, um, how do you determine like what's worth? I mean, oh yeah. You know, in email or like a thousand things, and you're like, yeah, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. But like, what's worth actually? That was actually, um, it's funny. That was my second talk that I had submitted. Uh, I had a talk. It was, it was an awful name. In fact, uh, my my wife hates this name so much. Uh, she told me Wes was going to quit the podcast because I insisted we name an episode of this, which was Keeping Up with the Kodashians. <laughs> she was like, no, not happening. Uh, we did it anyways, and uh, he was a little disappointed. Uh, but <laughs> it's tough. That's tough. Uh, specifically because, I don't know, you got to kind of have your ear to the ground in terms of who's using it, how they're using it, and what's the backing behind it, right? Uh, for instance, I was trying to decide what to do with my platform. I keep talking about this, but it's a big thing that I'm doing right now. And I was like, do I really want to get into another platform? You know, I'm in media. Do I really want to get into Next.js? Is this worth me spending the time learning it? And then Next.js to tweet it up, the, like the new Hulu rebuild was up next. And then I looked, looked at all their clients and was like, oh, well, there's a lot of people behind this and a lot of money and a lot of stakeholders that are going to make sure that this thing is going to stick around for a little bit. And so that tells me that's worth learning. So I like I, I to look at who's behind things and how many people are using it. Uh, for instance, there's a, um, a Redux competitor, MobX, that a lot of people use and a lot of people really like. I haven't used it. I haven't learned it specifically because it hasn't hit that sort of uh, market share level where you can tell that it's going to stick around in another you know, 10 year old. Well, nothing's just around 10 years, but like another couple of years where like, where's that community going to be once it goes away or once it dies down a little bit. So it's really tough. I started to learn Svelte 2 when it was Svelte 2, and then I found out that Svelte 3 was coming, and I was like, I'm just going to shelf it. Um, and I'm going to come back to it when it's Svelte 3. So uh, I, it's a little bit about analyzing who's using it, uh, what kind of like 
cloud that most people have to ensure that they need to use it. Um, and in, I, I think developer experience. Those um, state of JavaScript surveys are really good too to look at developer satisfaction. I like held off learning TypeScript for a long time because there's TypeScript, uh, Reason, and uh, Flow, and like they're all sort of competing. And then you see that developer satisfaction for TypeScript is like super high, and a ton of people are using it. Like, I gotta pay attention to this now more than I would have had before, you know? So uh, keep your eyes open for that kind of stuff. Yeah. So what if you have to learn like three fast, three furious? <laughs> <laughs> you have something dumped on you, you have to learn it by like yeah. this week. <laughs> yeah, uh, caffeine <laughs> and like a uh, real lot of cup of it. That's really, a, you know, just uh, like I personally, I dive into it. I learn really best by by writing a lot, and um, uh, we, we had to do that specifically with that Angular project because one of our coworkers got fired for not uh, not producing, and so we had now two people to do three people's job, and we had to do it one night, and neither of us knew Angular, so we were just sitting on chat the whole time. Hey, I just figured out you could do this. Oh, I just like that kind of communication helped really well. So if you have a team, being able to chat and share notes like that helped uh, really well, or share a style guide or whatever. Um, find those best practices, snip the libraries, and go for it. Yeah, just caffeinated up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, there's um, something. So you seem to be pretty solo on your endeavors. Yes. Yeah. Um, have you like done a lot of pair programming in the past? I have not done pair programming. Yeah, I've never done pair programming. I don't know if I would like it. I uh, well, not to say I don't know if I would like it. I don't know if my pair programming buddy would like it because <laughs> I have not focused. Like, I'll just <laughs> jump around here and then over here, and I'm working on this and that, and like. Uh, if I'm coding to like make stuff happen, I'll like I'll, I'll write the test and then I'll I'll oh yeah maybe you guys do some work on the API and then maybe edit and like it's 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 kind of a mess for me but uh, I I can see how pair programming would be excellent and for the right people involved. Cool. Well, thank thank everybody so much. Uh, <laughs>